Okay, so here we go with the story of the atom. So remember, through this, we are looking at the way that the atomic model evolved through history, but we're also using this as an illustration of the nature of science, how science works, um, how technology and the times we live in affect kind of the science that occurs, um, all of that. So, um, just as a refresher, again, you probably remember this maybe from biology. Um, in science, a lot of times what we're talking about, we're not talking about a law, like um, an equation, often a law is. We're talking about a theory, and a theory is based on observation and reasonable inferences. Um, they are the best explanation for why something occurs at the time, but they change as new evidence is discovered. So we talked about, um, or I mentioned in the intro, like the theory of evolution in biology. Um, Darwin laid out his theory of um, evolution by natural selection, and then when DNA was discovered, that became the mechanism for evolution to occur. So we didn't start from scratch, we incorporated new information into the theory. So same thing happens in chemistry. Um, it is a never-ending story until we can actually like zoom in and see inside of the atom. We won't know for sure that our ideas and understandings are truly correct. Um, so it goes on and on and on. Uh, but again, we're using the best information for what we know using the technology that we have right now. So, our story begins um, in 500 BC with a Greek philosopher, Democritus. Um, and Democritus is a philosopher rather than a scientist because, like, we didn't have science yet. Um, and the Greeks were thinking about the world around them, uh, but they didn't have really ways to test and get evidence for some of their musings. Um, so this is one of those examples when Democritus wasn't really able to give any evidence for why he thought the world was this way. Um, he just thought that it was. So um, he was the first one that we know of to have thought of this idea of the atom, that everything was made of these small indivisible parts of matter. Um, and the word atom itself comes from the Greek um, a, which means not, and tomos, which means cut. So, like, you couldn't cut it down any further. So that's kind of way, way, way back in history. Now we're going to zoom forward um, a ways to our next person. Okay, <clears throat> so our first scientist um, who came up with this idea of the atom and published and is well known um, was John Dalton. So you can see a picture of him there. And he lived from 1766. So you can imagine just like a little bit before the American Revolution, he was English, um, to 1844. Uh, <clears throat> he did um, experiments with chemicals, as many, many people did around uh, the 1800s. Um, and he noticed several things as he did his experiments about the way that chemicals could combine together to make new molecules. And from that, he came up with these postulates um, of what matter might be made up of. And you'll read a little bit more about the postulates and stuff in the book. Um, but in the end, from that evidence, 
he came up with the solid sphere model. So much like Democritus, he said that atoms were indivisible solids. So you can imagine like little tiny marbles um, making up everything. And that atoms were the smallest possible particle of matter. So again, he's getting this, um, he's getting information from doing experiments, and then he's using that data to come up with these postulates. So this is, we're at the beginning of modern science, whereas Democritus was more hypothetical. So Dalton's theory came out in a, around 1800, um, just for estimate's sake, and it really stuck around until 1900. So a good hundred years, um, his theory was the prevailing understanding of what matter was made up of. Um, and that happened for a couple of reasons. The first reason there was no evidence to suggest the theory was wrong. So remember in science, we use the best information that we have at the time. And then when evidence changes, then we incorporate that into the theory. There's no new evidence, no adjustments to the theory. Um, the other thing was that it like seemed reasonable, right? That you could break things into smaller pieces and then go no farther. Um, so why would anyone doubt it if it made sense with what we see with our eyes when we interact with, with matter? But then something exciting happens. So around the 1900s, uh, people are starting to get very interested in electricity, um, <clears throat> and again, just trying to figure out the nature of matter. And so around that time, there's a gentleman named J.J. Thompson who discovered that these cathode rays, which you see um, this green, the green ray, this is the cathode ray, um, he discovered that they were actually small negatively charged particles because the ray could be bent when a positive charge was applied. So if he was applying a positive charge here, you can see the ray is bending toward the positive charge. So opposites attract. So if it's bending toward the positive charge, then they must be negatively charged particles. Uh, because of the way that the rays were produced uh, by it, <clears throat> he believed that these particles were the building blocks of atoms. And again, you'll read a little bit more about this in the book. So he had this new discovery, these electrons, building blocks of atoms. And so Dalton's theory didn't really work anymore, right? Because if the atom is a solid sphere, where are these electrons coming from? And if you can't get any smaller than an atom, they could measure that electrons were much smaller um, than atoms than themselves. So Thompson had to, again, take the new evidence found by the new technology and come up with a new model. Um, so Thompson's model is the plum pudding model. He's English. We might do the chocolate chip cookie model um, nowadays. So what he said was there was pudding, that was the atom itself, the red in the picture, um, and then the electrons were studded throughout the positive pudding, um, like the plums in plum pudding, or like raisins, uh, not raisins, oh gosh, like chocolate chips and chocolate chip cookie dough. Um, so again, taking new data, new information, we're not throwing out this idea that atoms exist, he's just adjusting it to fit new evidence. So Thompson's model did some interesting things for our future 
understanding um, of the atom. So it led to the acceptance of the proton that had been observed in 1886, so about 15 years before um, the electron, but it wasn't really accepted until the electron. Um, likewise, the neutron, that wasn't accepted until much later, in 1932. Um, so because the neutron is neutral, has no electric charge, that made it much more difficult to measure. Um, so that's why it is much farther. But having this, knowing that there was one smaller particle, the electron, made it easier for people to accept that there were others. Um, and this is just a little review of subatomic particles. Um, so this hopefully you remember a little bit from biology or from physical science even. Um, and this is the math in grams. We usually use zero and then one AMU and one AMU for protons and neutrons. Um, we'll talk much more about mass later on. So we're at the early 1900s, 1902. Um, we have this plum pudding model. When we come back um, next time, or in the next section, you'll see kind of how that model um, continues to develop. So thanks guys.